So welcome everybody. Again, it's good to have you here. Um, we will be <clears throat> covering the second part of uh, four of the uh, Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, today, um, we'll be covering the first three of the eight Noble Path. A brief review for those of you who weren't here in the last few weeks. Um, one of the first uh, sermon, in, in one of the first sermons by the Buddha, he taught the Four Noble Truths. First one is that in life there is suffering. Second, the cause of that suffering is our desires and ignorance. Third, there is a cure for that suffering. And that cure is number four, the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Eightfold Path is a prescription, a guide for how we should live our lives so that we can reduce and eventually eliminate suffering in ourselves and hopefully some in others as well. I mentioned last week that it's hard to really think of the Eightfold Path as uh, steps to take um, because it's hard to work on one of the Eightfold Path and not work on the others. They are very much interconnected and interrelated to each other. I did mention that one possible start, one possible place to start with the Eightfold Path are with the um, morality paths. And so there are, there's a morality path, uh, there is a wisdom path, and then there is a, th uh, th a thinking uh, um, mental path. Um, and that's just one way of dividing the eight and full noble paths. Um, you'll hear me sort of be very ambivalent about this division or steps or things like that, um, because uh, in much the same way that we, if I were to give you a ball and ask you, where does the ball start? There really is no good answer. Um, there really is no good, there is no start per se to the Eightfold Path. You simply pick a spot and start moving from there. But what you will find is, um, in much the same way as a sort of a path, a journey up a mountain, uh, trying to reach a peak. The peak, even though you're not at the peak, is influencing the beginning of your journey. It is part of the goal. And so even though you've not accomplished the peak yet, it is still very much a part of that very first step you take. So anywhere you begin will help. The ultimate goal is to uh, be enlightened, be awakened, uh, suffer less, and be much more joyful in our lives. I often recommend uh, starting off with the morality uh, eightfold path um, because much like uh, sort of everything on earth comes from the earth, um, everything is tied to the earth, much of everything else in the Eightfold Path uh, is definitely runs through uh, how we act, how we speak, how are, we interact with others. Um, and those interactions are guided very much by our moral compass. And so if we can get our actions, if we can get our morality right, if we get our morality healthy and robust, then it really provides us with the ability to fully engage the rest of the Eightfold Path. Um, now, morality is often less exciting than meditation. So when people think Buddhism, they're thinking, ooh, meditation, maybe I can float in the air, uh, maybe I can... Um, find peace and tranquility. And so we, we go, many people go straight to the meditation part. And we see also a lot of mindfulness this, mindfulness that. We see uh, mindfulness sales, mindfulness um, business. Uh, we're seeing the term mindfulness used in many different ways. Um, but 
you can mindfully murder. I am pretty sure, although I've never been a serial killer, that these serial killers are very mindful and very much present in the now as they are engaging in their murderous activities. So the danger of not developing first a good moral basis is that if we were to fully develop these other skills first, um, we may misuse, abuse, uh, or be misdirected in how we apply them. So I'm not saying don't be mindful. I'm not saying don't meditate. Um, what I am saying is that at the beginning, place a little more emphasis on the morality aspect and it will aid and help and guide the development of mindfulness, of meditation and of the rest of the Eightfold Path. We also mentioned that there are two main aspects to morality that is common in many different religions. One is equality and one is reciprocity. Equality is this idea, equality from the perspective of Buddhism is that we are all equal. We all desire to be happy. We all want uh, to, to avoid suffering. Uh, we all want to avoid death. Um, we want to enjoy life. And so this equality, this universality is a common element amongst all living beings, not just humans, but we can see evidence of animals wanting to live. We can see am evidence of animals wanting to avoid death or avoid suffering. Okay, So this is a common um, characteristic of all living creatures and is therefore a common universal element principle of morality. The next one is reciprocity, which many of us learned as the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Buddhism pretty much says the same thing, but from the perspective of suffering, in much the same way that you don't like to suffer or to be abused or to be robbed, uh, or if you don't want to be murdered, others have those same desires. And so you don't want to do to other beings what you yourself would not like. And that's the element of reciprocity then in our morality. And throughout these three noble paths, the morality path, um, we should keep in mind these two principles of equality and reciprocity. Now, the morality path consists of three paths, noble, eight noble paths of the eight noble paths. They are right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And so I'm going to speak briefly to each of these. It is difficult to summarize these teachings because you could spend a whole year studying the Eightfold Path and still not exhaust everything that there is to learn. So I will give you a very superficial overview of these, uh, yeah, these three noble paths. Right speech. Let's start with that one. When I was a kid in Catholic school, I had a priest tell this story during a sermon, uh, and it stuck with me. Um, a teacher asked a, uh, his students to bring him pictures of the deadliest weapon. Um, and so the students, very eager and wanting to be the top student in the class, went out did their research and brought back pictures of what they thought was the deadliest weapons. The first one brought a picture of a virus and saying, here is the, the you know, this, this is disease and illness. It could wipe out a whole population. The teacher was like, oh, it's a good one. Okay. Went to the second student and the second student had pictures of nuclear weapons and said, this is a weapon that can wipe out a whole city and destroy potentially the whole world. 
All right. The teacher was impressed. Didn't know how the third student was going to top that one. And then the third student came up and presented his picture. And on it was simply a picture of the human tongue. The idea being that speech is the deadliest of weapons. So it is with this idea that um, speech is a powerful tool, um, puts into context the importance of developing right speech. No other animal as of yet, we have not encountered any animal that has as complex an ability to communicate as the human species. While other species do have the ability to communicate and communicate with others of their own kind. Um, and we can even communicate basically between species. You know, I can still teach my dog to sit and lay down, all right? They can ring a bell and make me go out and open the door for them, all right? So they can train us as well. There is some basic communication, but the complexity of language, of human language has not been matched by any other animal. And so here we have an ability, uh, a characteristic of our species that is capable of being very deadly, but also, and this is the hopeful element of this noble path, with speech, we can heal. With speech, we can um, alleviate suffering. And so how do we do that, okay? First, the Buddha talks about what are four things that we should avoid in our speech. And that is uh, lying, slander, harsh words, and idle talk, basically gossip. Okay. Of the four, a lot of emphasis is placed on lying, as lying seems to be very much at the root of a lot of the suffering in this world. And not just lying to each other. As a psychologist, I can tell you we do a great job of lying to ourselves. And so the lying, the speech does not necessarily have to be just what we say aloud, but what we say to ourselves. There is a form of psychology called narrative psychology in which the emphasis is placed on the story we build for ourselves, the story that we build to understand the world around us. And when we incorporate unhealthy elements into that narrative, we suffer, we experience pain. And one of the key sources of that suffering is, the, are the lies that we tell ourselves and the lies that we tell each other. The Buddha, once one speaking to his son, Rahula, and said that if the individual is capable of lying and compromising their virtue, then that means that they are willing and capable of compromising all of their virtues. And so lying is the um, number one thing we really try to avoid when we are practicing right speech. Now, I understand that there are times it, that little white lies lubricate the social fabric, the community, the social interactions. If my wife comes to me and says, do I look fat in this? What do I say? I could just lie and say, it looks fantastic on you or you know, just say, no, you don't look fat if she really, if, if she is a little overweight. Or I could say, you know, you look beautiful in it to me. And as long as I'm not lying and I'm sincere about that, then uh, I'm addressing uh, her insecurities, but at the same time, um, acknowledging and letting her know, I still find you beautiful. And so those are, there are healthy ways to still communicate and to still say things um, without having to always engage in the white lies. Um, 
So we try to reduce those. Now, Buddhism is pretty practical. So it recognizes that we simply cannot um, tell the truth 100% of the time. And so I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But in general, you want to try and avoid the lying. The other three are pretty easy. Harsh speech, we try to avoid anything that will um, increase suffering. All right. And we don't like being spoken to harshly. And so neither should we do it to others. So there we have the equality and the reciprocity. Okay. Um, slander. Uh, slander from this perspective is um, uh, talking ill of other people. Okay. The reason we try to avoid this is because it sows division. It sows um, more suffering. Um, and so we avoid and we try to avoid uh, speaking negatively about others. And then the last one, idle talk. Some have taken it literally. And so you, you will find monks around the world who don't speak uh, because they do not want to engage in idle talk. You will find others who will interpret idle talk as uh, any unnecessary speech. But the more accepted and the more or the understanding of idle talk that's most taught is uh, that you shouldn't gossip. That this idea of gossiping uh, is also sows division and um, suffering. So that's right speech. Those are the four things to try to avoid. But in general, then, right speech means that you are using speech in a way that is healing, inspirational, loving, and compassionate. We've seen examples of, of huge speeches by Martin Luther King Jr. or, um, oh, I can't believe I forgot her name, this the young African-American woman who did the poem at, uh, at the inauguration. Uh, and her inspirational poem, and she did another one during the Super Bowl. And so here is a woman who is using her speech to help unite and to heal. So that is right speech. Um, Amanda Gorman, thank you, Chris. And so Amanda Gorman is a, is a good example of someone using right speech. Um, I think I'll, I have that. that's about it I'll say there. I will bring back again the idea of this narrative therapy. When we engage in right speech, we engage in building, creating a narrative, a story that can be healthy and robust, that can withstand the buffets of uh, the hurricanes around us. Um, a story that will be stable uh, and can be inspirational to ourselves and to others. The next one is right action. And right action, um, boils down to respect for life, respect for property, and respect for personal relationships. Okay. Respect for life is pretty easy. We all want to live. We all don't want to suffer. And so we try and be very respectful of other people's right to live, um, including other creatures. And so we try to engage in behaviors that does not create un, uh, undue suffering in others, um, whether they be human or non-human. And... Um, the reason why we try and respect life and not end it is that every life has the potential for enlightenment. And so we try not to snuff out that potential. Then we have respect for property. Uh, and so we, we, right action means not taking things that are not yours, but it also means things like uh, a fair wage. And so employ, employers 
who don't pay their workers for work they've done, um, that is a violation of, of, of respecting property. Or if you shirk your duties at work um, and get paid for doing nothing, um, then that's a way of stealing also from the employer. And so it's not just about properties or things, but in your actions, are you stealing away? Are you stealing happiness from someone else? Right? Are you stealing their ability to pursue happiness or making it harder for them? All right. So theft isn't just theft of material things. Um, it can also move into a sort of a more abstract level. And finally, right action means uh, respect for relationships. You'll hear the term in Buddhism, sexual misconduct, or doing away with sexual misconduct. The idea there is um, not engaging in sensual behaviors and not just physical sex, but anything to deal with the senses, not over engaging in anything that overstimulates the senses and creates the potential for suffering in yourself or others. Sexual misconduct is a little easier to, to look at towards for that example, because we see that infidelity creates a lot of suffering, um, not only for the person who was being unfaithful to, uh, but the person uh, committing the infidelity, I can tell you, goes through a lot of suffering as well. So it's just not a conducive um, act to relieving suffering. So right action, trying to engage in um, not engage in sexual activities that will um, create more suffering. So someone here asked about overeating. I would say yes, that that would fall under right action. You are eating for the sensual pleasure of eating, not for nourishment, for sustaining health. So when I binge on Easter bunny peeps, when they come out, that's not something I'm doing because I need to be, you know, I, I need some healthy nourishment, All right? I, I have my big glass of milk and my whole container of peeps and I eat them in one sitting sometimes. That's not healthy. And so that is a good example of overindulging in the senses, not for the sake of being healthy, um, but just to overindulge sensual pleasures. And the end result is I feel pretty crappy afterwards with all that sugar in my body. And I'm feeling it now that I'm older than I use it more than I used to uh, when I was in college. Um, so it's easier for me, for me to be mindful of that. So yes, any overindulging of the pleasures. Um, let me see where we do. Another example of overindulging in pleasures is anything like alcohol and drugs, uh, pornography, um, excessive, excessively violent uh, movies or video games. Um, games in, can also be an overindulgence. Um, and so not all of these things are necessarily all bad. So games uh, to a certain extent is, it's a good distraction. It gives you a nice break. Um, but we know of people where I know of personally know of vets who in order to avoid dealing with their PTSD, uh, spend their whole day playing video games and don't engage in any work, and don't engage the community, don't engage their spouses. So any form of overindulgence like that can lead to more suffering. Um, now, those are the don'ts, but right action, if you really you know just the way it's written, it's, there's a lot of positives as well. What are the positive things that we can do to engage in that um, already, based on some of the examples, one thing to do is just moderation. So you can still enjoy those things just in moderation.
Okay. Um, some things Buddhism would discourage altogether because there are very, if any, examples of times when those things might actually be helpful. Um, Let's take drugs, for example. One of the reasons that illegal drugs create suffering is that the, the level of benefit and the level of overdose are very close together. Uh, Tylenol, for example, the level at which it is effective is way, for, way down the level at which it can become toxic. Okay. So that's why that's a medication that we can do over the counter. Other medications are prescribed, but they still have a rather large gap between where the benefit is and where the dangerous level dosage is. But for many of the illicit drugs, that gap between benefit and danger is very, very small. Um, and many people do not have the scientific know-how uh, to be able to precisely measure what is the right amount of uh, drug. Okay. And so those are one of the reasons why Buddhism would frown upon uh, use of that. The other way would be that it's also um, clouds the judgment. And the, what you want to try, one of the things that Buddhism tries to achieve is clarity. Okay. So what are examples of things you can engage in that in uh, enhance clarity, enhance um, happiness and joy. Hugs are a really good right action. Um, kisses with loved ones um, that are welcome, please, that are welcomed, and <laughs> not just kissing everyone at, on down the street. Um, healthy eating. Um, reading good books. Actually, let me talk a little bit about that. So the way the brain knows when something is important, so the brain itself is not conscious. Okay, So unlike what we see in the movies where there, they may have four or five people inside the brain making decisions and talking to each other, our brain does not have that consciousness. And so our brain has some basic mechanisms that don't rely on us thinking. And one of those mechanisms is when a neural pathway is fired a lot and is used a lot, the brain takes that as a signal that that is an important neural pathway that it needs to reinforce by making more connections with more parts of your brain. So, eating that candy bar fires the neurons that create pleasure, that create satisfaction, satia satiation. Um, you have maybe positive associations of that from your childhood. And so, eating more and more candy emphasizes that. And so, it creates then a uh, more pathways for that. And it you can develop a, uh, a, an addiction or a um, dependence on uh, sugars, okay? If you engage in watching a lot of violent TV, um, think about how you feel maybe after watching a boxing match or a UFC match. Um, there is a, or a movie, an action movie, you leave the movie theater feeling all pumped up and energized. And it's because for about an hour, two hours, you emphasize a neural pathway that um, gave a positive reward to violent acts. And if that is repeated over and over again, then the brain sees this as a, well, those are good, those are the neural connections we're going to reinforce. If instead you engage in activities that are, let's say, more loving, um, or you write a gratitude journal every evening, 
Will you make it a point every day to say something positive to someone else? When you emphasize and repeat those neural pathways, then the brain will strengthen those. Uh, so this is the reason why that, that's where that moderation is important. And also why you can use the mechanisms of, um, that lead to addiction to become addicted. You can't really become addicted to good acts, but they can become easier and easier to do the more you practice them. Finally, let's talk about right livelihood and wrap up here. Uh, right livelihood is basically very much like right action, except that it's about your career. What about your career are you going to do that is a right livelihood? Um, first, the negatives on Buddhism, it discourages anything, any sort of livelihood or career that it deals with slaughtering animals, with slave trade, um, uh, dealing in poisons, dealing in arms, or dealing in intoxicants. Um, it's a little harder to deal in, in poisons nowadays, uh, but it is easy to deal in intoxicants. Um, so liquor stores and uh, drug dealers. And so you want to avoid these livelihoods because they are a source of a lot of division in the world, a lot of suffering. Um, some translations I see also uh, included soldiers, uh, but in other translations, I'll see soldiers that are fighting for unjust causes. Now, who decides what's just and unjust um, can be tricky. Um, and so, in general, uh, Buddhism would uh, discourage uh, a life as a soldier, um, but I also see a lot of translations where recognizing the role soldiers have in protecting the weak, in protecting um, just systems. Um, so just so you're aware of those things. Right livelihood for you should mean finding out how your career is contributing to the community, to reducing suffering, um, to equality and reciprocity. The more easily you can find where these things lie in your career, um, the more satisfaction you'll get out of that career. Yeah. So um, teachers are a good example. I had a my, my mom was a teacher. And even though she could have earned more money as a respiratory therapist uh, with her license, she chose a life of teaching because teaching was a way of reducing suffering in the world. Teaching was a way of contributing to the community. Uh, so that is a very good livelihood. And it's one of the reasons why in many of the Eastern cultures, teachers are so highly respected. So just find a career, find meaning in your career. How does it reduce suffering? How does it um, increase joy? So that would be right livelihood. All right, so those are the three, right action, uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Engaging in these three will bring in a more moral life. And by having a more moral life, you'll experience more tranquility, more stability, and more strength. Um, that's what the, the, the Buddhist scriptures say. It's what I experienced in my life. For those of you who are former Christians or suffering from post-traumatic church syndrome, this is the moment when your experience actually can help enhance your ability to live out the morality pathway. And so I know for me, <clears throat> as someone who 
um, studied in a Christian school, uh, even went into the seminary for a while. The moral compass, the morality of that Christian faith, it helped me very easily um, adopt that the 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 moral lifestyle, Buddhist lifestyle. But and here's the trick: where the Christianity and Buddhism differ is that currently the way. Christianity is practiced in many areas is enlaced with a lot of guilt and dogma and judgment. But Buddhism teaches us that those elements are not healthy. And so if you want to bring in the good aspects of your Christian history, you'll need to work at peeling away at that guilt peeling away at the judgment, peeling away the, uh, the, the dogma. Um, the idea of you're a sinner has a very judgmental element to it. And so peeling away that and accepting, for example, the equality principle of morality, that we're all equal, we all just want to suffer less. And when I've engaged in those sinful acts, it was me trying to escape some suffering in a way that wasn't healthy. And so now instead of being a bad person who is uh, tainted and going to uh, the lower levels of hell, um, I'm simply a human being who is suffering and I'm trying to suffer less. So it takes a little practice to sort of peel away that judge judgment the dogma and the the guilt associated with uh, those moral uh, teachings, but if you can do that successfully, it will enhance your ability to follow the eightfold path. And if you just think about it from a practical sense. If I act in a moral way, even if I get no reward at the end, there's no heaven, right? Or there's no reward here for uh, being praised as a good person. If I just choose to live a moral life, I am eliminating a lot of the things that cause suffering in my life. If I live a moral life, I'm just quite practically and logically eliminating the things that are creating a lot of suffering. And so it's not asking you to behave because someone's watching you. It's asking us to behave morally because you will be happier, because others around you will be happier. because you and others around you will suffer less. So that's, to me, the practicality of Buddhism. To me, that is the essence of these three noble eightfold paths. That there are things you can change, things you can change in your life right now that will just make you happier and will eliminate the environment that creates the suffering. I also said I would come back to the topic of um, being 100% moral. Buddhism does not expect us to be 100% perfect. In fact, it's in the trying to live a moral life that we learn the lessons. The majority of the lessons come from trying to live a moral life. And if you compound your or make it so difficult to live a moral life, if you're so hard on yourself because you are an immoral person, it will only make it harder for you uh, in this path and this journey. Buddhism is asking you to just try your best. 
And when you fail, learn from it and try again. And there's no um, punishment for not getting it right, but there is a reward for getting it right. And the more and more you're able to engage the Eightfold Path, you will experience the happiness, the joy, and that you suffer less. Um, I'm often asked, is there an afterlife in Buddhism? Do you believe in reincarnation? And my answer always is, I don't know, and I don't care, because I know that right now, whether there is a heaven or not, whether there is a nirvana or not, right now, I am happiest when I am engaging in the right path. I encourage you to, I mentioned a lot of lists today. Um, and so it takes, so reflect back. Um, what are things that maybe you'd like to change? What are things you'd like to try? Or maybe reflect on how hard you are on yourself. And where does that come from? Is that from your history? Is that from your parents? Is that from your former church? Why are you so hard on yourself? And so maybe your path right now is to be a little more compassionate to yourself. Once you're able to develop a good lifestyle, then it becomes easier to do the other eightfold paths. And we'll start talking about those then in, um, in about three weeks. Next week, uh, Leon, are you still on for the parable next week? All right. So Leon will, will, uh, will bring us another Buddhist parable. And like we did in January, what you'll do is you'll we'll listen to the parable and each of us will then bring our own interpretations and, and thoughts on the parable. Uh, I'll continue then part three of the talk on, it'll be March 3rd. So that, no, I'm sorry, no, March 2nd is the first Tuesday of March, and that's when the next part of, the, of this talk will come. And we'll talk about the, um, the right effort, uh, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Great. Thank you very much. What I'll do is I'll just open it up. Oof, I went way long today. Sorry about that. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. I have a brief question. Is there any difference? Maybe someone else asked before when I wasn't here. Is there any difference between um, meditation, you know, when you use music, guided meditation, or music meditation with music, and just meditation, how we did today, just focus on the breathing or counting or mantra? Is there is any impact less useful than other? the music so i first started meditating um at the age of 12 and i used music a lot um and um didn't really not use music and and then eventually incense um eventually stopped using music and incense when I went into the seminary and I didn't have a radio and, and stuff like that. And so I had to learn how to meditate without that. Um, but I still had my rituals of the sign of the cross and all these other things. Um, and then when I came to Buddhism, um, I saw, you know, that they had their bowing and their bells and the incense. Um, and I could see why those things are beneficial, but I also wanted a practice that didn't depend on those things. And I was able to think that because I went through that experience of learning how to meditate with music and then not have it, <laughs> having to relearn to meditate without it. And so that's, what ta that's where I learned that my pr I wanted a practice that did not depend on those things. So that if I'm in an airplane, a bus, or car, if I am at a party, at a concert, or in a quiet place in the woods, um, doesn't matter, I can still meditate. Thank you. Yeah.
So I think do what you what works best for you. If you can't meditate just focusing on breathing, then use guided meditation, use music, use incense, use whatever it, it takes to start building the practice. Um, and when you feel the time is right, then you can sort of take some of those stuff away. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts, or comments? On the book you said? Dhammapada? That should, yes, that we should get one with commentary. Is that what you said? I recommend it because there is a lot. The Dhammapada is just so rich in history. And, and the people who wrote it and read it originally knew a lot of this context already, which we've lost several thousand years later, you know, a couple thousand years later. And so having those commentaries helps put some of what we're reading in context and guides some of our interpretation. So what is the, it, what is that considered? Is it just the teachings of Buddha or is it considered like a Bible or what, I mean, what is kind of the context of that book? So I wouldn't say we have a Bible. We have suttas, sutras, um, depending on the translations, either you'll see them as sutta, S-U-T-T-A, or sutra, S-U-T-R-A. And it's just holy scriptures. And so these are just scriptures. And the thing is that Buddhism wasn't written down until, um, I think it was 600 years after Buddha's death. So for the longest time, Buddhism was an oral tradition, meaning that, well, with imperfect human beings, some stuff was lost. Um, and so we, we, when I teach Buddhism, I try to move away from this dogmatic uh, dependence on scriptures. Um, I think the scriptures and the writings are useful tools. I'll use an imagery from one of the scriptures. The finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. The finger pointing at the moon is not the moon. It's a, it's a famous saying in Buddhism. And the idea is that this finger might be pointing to the enlightenment, but the finger itself is not enlightenment. So don't worship the finger. Mm -hmm. don't, be, don't give this finger undue importance because it's supposed to guide us to something that's higher or transcending this finger. And so the scriptures are the fingers. The sutras are the fingers. They're pointing at a deeper understanding, um, pointing at a, a, a truth that is beyond what can be captured by language. So avoid being a Barnes and Noble Buddhist. Those scriptures, those readings are helpful tools. They are fingers, but true wisdom, and actually we'll be talking about this as part of the Eightfold Path. The wisdom comes when you actually start practicing and trying to incorporate those teachings in your lives. And what happens is, you know, that saying that Chris copied down from the Dhammapada will now be a finger pointing at a deeper meaning for me. And so it's not necessary for me to memorize the verse. What's important is that I understand that deeper meaning. And so read, that's why I often will encourage you to read different translations. Uh, that's why I encourage people to go to other teachers, not just me. Uh, I'm just a, a finger, sometimes a middle finger, but I'm just a finger pointing at something. But you need to experience it yourself and find other ways, other teachers who teach it a different way. Because in somewhere where we overlap is where you'll find the truth. And that's also why I have a hard time um, bring, putting down any religion. Because every religion, you'll see a lot of overlap in all the religions because there's, there's an underlying truth. So religion is the finger. And what we, instead of giving the religion so much importance, we should be trying to achieve, uh, try to understand that underlying truth. That's a really good image. I, because I, I've been trying to wrap my brain around it with this very... Christian brought up brain where the holy scriptures are the thing and so not being able to find the thing here has been very um, uncomfortable which I guess is part of that journey good 
that discomfort will, that's similar to my discomfort of not having music when I was meditating. It yeah. challenged me to grow. And so that discomfort you're feeling right now is a good thing because it's going to challenge you to grow. Mm -hmm. So keep it up. Okay. <clears throat> um, in fact, that is one of the warnings. If ever anyone tells you they have the answer, run. <laughs> run away. That's not the right teacher for you. Any other questions, comments? All right, let's go ahead and end it there. I'm sorry we went over today. Um, so much for the <laughs> I'll, I'll be more concise next week, I promise. Take care, everyone. I will stick around if anyone else has any other questions. Otherwise, thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.